I have no more time. Uh, let's start the um, energy workshop, uh, energy and climate workshop. Um, uh, we have time until is, uh, 7, right? Right, correct? Okay, so let's aim at two hours session. Um, and uh, 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 if you want to have a floor, uh, you have to push the button. I mean, when, if I give you a floor and then push the button again to off, uh, to turn off the light. Uh, that is uh, the process of getting the floor. Um, this is an energy session. Um, <laughs> I have some short presentation of uh, how I see the current energy security uh, and climate mitigation or sustainability issue be combined together. Um, and some uh, issues for or security as well as uh, policy of geopolitics. And it covers very well what we are going to discuss. So just give me uh, 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 the present uh, focus the presentation over there. I used to work for the IEA, International Energy Agency. Um, it always gives some interesting insight by the World Energy Outlook. This is a, the new one will come very soon, but uh, last year it was the 2017 version. And they give us a very interesting four revolutions in the energy sector, in upheavals, I may say. One is, the first one is the U.S. shale revolution. So it gives U.S. an undisputed global leader for oil and gas. This is a very strong word, undisputed. Uh, because of gas is already, U.S. is gas exporter, will soon be the oil exporter. So energy independence, energy dominance is what uh, uh, former uh, President Obama as well as Mr. Trump really wish to say. So U.S. is a hegemon in the fossil field. Coal is also abundant in the U.S. Another second revolution is solar photovoltaic revolution, and IEA first admit that solar photovoltaic will be the cheapest source of energy, new energy, new electricity in many countries. This is the first time ever IEA admitted, and this has a huge impact to the relative price of the mix, to gas, to coal, to renewables, uh, excuse me, to the nuclear, this has huge implication. The third one is uh, China. And China is moving toward the green revolution by using gas to replace coal and lots of uh, renewables with uh, state grids expanding the grid lines. So China's green revolution is the third revolution. And the fourth one is electrification. So using the electric vehicles, digitalization, AI. Uh, so this is the feature of the future energy. And those who don't understand, uh, this will force countries to reappraise the uh, energy security and, and sustainability uh, 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 strategies. And those who don't understand will perish, that, that they say. The important thing is the latter three revolutions are happening in China. Vis-a-vis -vis U.S. is leading the fossil fuel, so China's strategy is clear by connecting grid lines and using photovoltaic, solar, and wind for the electric vehicle. So U.S. is the conventional leader of the energy by shale revolution, while China is trying to be the new generation revolution by the photovoltaic and electricity, EV, etc. So this dichotomy is happening in, China, in, in the world energy market. Which side are you taking or which policy you are taking between these two major players is the issue. This is a chart of energy independ uh, dependence on oil and gas importation. The vertical axis is gas import ratio, while horizontal one is the oil import ratio. So you can see that in the right, right hand upper side is both importer of oil and gas. The left is both exporter of oil and gas. And green, a blue to red uh, from 20, current situation to 2040 change. So China is now importing 60% of oil and about 30% of gas. Will soon be the 80% importer of oil and 
40% of gas importer. So India getting worse. Japan, Korea stuck in the 100% right hand top corner because we continue to import 100% of oil and gas. We stuck there. The U.S. moving toward the other direction. This is a very big uh, contrast. U.S. will be the exporter both of gas and oil in the future. So they are, the U.S. is a kind of joining the exporter side rather than importer side. The China's policy is building another axe, the third axe or, uh, uh, of renewable energy and increasing renewable energy and reducing the fossil fuel dependency from Middle East, from Russia, and from the United States. That is China's geopolitical strategy. So they have much more freedom of, of messing the Middle East or, uh, or fighting with Russia. Uh, so U.S. advantage of this share revolution is tremendous. So Japan, Korea should depend on the oil and gas from Middle East, but the situation of the Middle East, as everybody knows, from the U.S. Uh, retrieval, uh, retrieved from the JCPOA of Iran, where this geopolitical situation is certainly suffer the country like China, India, ASEAN in the future, European Union, Japan, Korea. So these countries, in a way, should make a collective energy security vis-a-vis -vis exporting countries. Um, I don't want to go too much, but this graph shows clearly where the future of the energy mix happens. All the renewables. Nuclear play a role, but very limited. Gas is still important. Coal will reduce its importance. And this is the cost of power generation in China. The solar is getting very cheap, wind is getting cheaper, while coal and gas increase means solar will be the cheapest source of energy in 2040. So that will re definitely be making a huge uh, uh, impact to the China, China's policy, uh, energy mix. So this is what China is saying about global energy interconnection. This is the electricity version of one road, one belt strategy. So do, you, do we connect our grid to China for cheaper renewable sources but losing some dependence, I mean, uh, independence? Or independently develop our energy security and sustainability? This is a really challenge for the countries around. Um, Mr. Bakuri of uh, Masen talked about connecting um, Morocco to Europe by grid line. It's already connected. So Europe is, has established this connectivity of grid lines and pipeline. This is a collective energy security and sustainability strategy while Morocco is joining this European integration of the energy sector. So this is the way, one good example and good model for security. Japan's problem is we are separated east and west so there's, we lost the electricity after the great earthquake and tsunami. Western part has a lots of spare capacity but cannot transmit that electricity to the east who lost the nuclear power. So blackout happens. Hokkaido recently made a total blackout in the Northern Ireland because the connectivity was very weak. So for the security purposes and use of more renewables, this in integration or co connectivity is very important. Um, I don't want to, this is the renewable energy 100% companies. I ask this question to Carlos Gong. Are you joining this? Because you can see that GM, BMW, Apple, famous big corporations are member, 140 more. And these companies are aiming at renewable energy 100% user by 2030 or 2050. And they are requesting their suppliers to do the same. If that is happening, who, which company in the supply chain of these major global companies buy the power generated by coal, for example? Coal has no future. How can we get out of coal to do something else? How can we get 
rid of even oil and gas for the fuel purposes in the future, and then what kind of future the uh, Middle East oil producing, gas producing country should think about to live with this kind of structural change which is triggered by the demand side. This demand side pressure will be a very big one for the energy supply. We are always talking about supply side, but demand side sustainability pressure will be very strong. That is the reason why I asked this question to Carlos Ghosn yesterday, uh, this, uh, this uh, morning. And this is the peak oil will happen when? Uh, IA sustainable scenario, sustainability development scenario say it may, it may happen as early as 2020. It should happen by 2020. In the, in the likely scenario, the peak demand of oil will not happen so easily. I was invited by the Saudi Aramco's uh, Al Farisan to make a, some uh, assessment with Daniel Yagin about two years ago. When the peak demand of oil happens, that was a question to me. I said by 2030 maybe. And Saudi Aramco, maybe Lila will tell us more, but uh, Saudi Aramco is thinking about hydrogen for a future of the clean oil. That is interesting technological development. So some kind of this, this uh, let's say, sus uh, 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 geopolitical pressure as well as sustainable pressure will make a huge impact to everybody. That is what I wanted to say. And Final point about nuclear. Can nuclear survive? This is the cost curve of uh, relative uh, generation, electric generation by the Lazard, um, American investment bank. And nuclear is moving up dramatically because of the Fukushima accident. The cost of safety is making the nuclear light water reactors cost higher and higher. While solar and wind is getting cheaper and cheaper. How could nuclear continue? This is the question which I asked to the French, for, I mean the Prime Minister, uh, Laurent Fabius, last night. Can France lead the global community of do, using more nuclear for the sustainability sake with this cost curve? This is a really challenge for France and Japan and those countries who want to use nuclear. That's for new nuclear. Yes, this is for new, new for nuclear. No, 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 no. Outstanding is much cheaper. Correct. Exactly. Correct. That's right. Uh, restarting nuclear power in Japan is much cheaper. This is a new plant. So replacing the old, nucle old reactor by the new one doesn't make any sense. That is the point. You're right, Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much. So this is the cost, average cost of power generation in the different countries. Japan is the highest cost, while Russia, China, Canada, US are the lower. So can Japan compete with other countries if the cost of electricity is so high? So how can we make a cheaper mix of electricity by using more renewables, etc., and be competitive? So. This is a kind of a difficult but interesting, uh, let's say, issue which we want to discuss. This is a nuclear, I think, only solution for the nuclear is fourth generation small modular type. Current big light water reactor will not have any future. So there are many countries who are interested in using light water reactor system, but stop it, probably it's not a good idea. It is just doesn't have any uh, cost competitiveness relative to the renewables. Okay, let's stop here and we will start the uh, 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 expose by uh, our uh, panelists. And first in my list is Olivier Per. Okay, uh, I'm, uh, I will, um, uh, like in my presentation to set up the scene of the US and China. We discussed uh, yesterday and today about uh, the, trade, uh, 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 the trade battle between those two countries 
And uh, I think it's uh, interesting, and it was on the agenda of this uh, meeting, I think it's interesting to consider what could be the impact of this trade war on the energy scene. And first of all, I would like to highlight the, uh, le, the, landscape, the, the change of the, the landscape both in uh, China and in the U.S. Uh, the, the last 10 years. And in fact, for the last 10 years, the landscape has dramatically changed. And just consider the figures, some figures, in 2007 and 2017. Energy demand in the U.S. is characterized by a great stability, uh, but there is a game changer of uh, the uh, uh, shale revolution, but I will come back afterwards. Total <coughs> energy consumption as well as oil consumption decreased by around 4%. And uh, refinery capacity is almost uh, stable. Uh, on the contrary, total energy consumption in, uh, of China increased during this same period by 45%, oil consumption by 54%, and refining capacity by 66% uh, just in 10 years. Uh, Internal production of uh, oil remained stable in China, increased uh, in, uh, uh, for gas, but in fact consumption of gas has been multiplied by a factor of four in just 10 years. So China is now the second importer of LNG behind Japan. Coal production and consumption grew by 20%. We, uh, it's, uh, uh, in the Western country, we consider that uh, coal is over, but it's not the case in China, and the consumption increased. But coal demand peaked in uh, 2013, despite a recent slight increase. China has, moved, uh, has started to move away from coal, uh, and in those last 10 years, the share of coal in China's primary energy mix declined to 60.4% from 74% just 10 years ago. Electricity consumption almost doubled, and it is clear that uh, energy security is the Achilles heel of China. China's oil import dependency rose, ratio rose to 68% in 2017, uh, the highest in its history, and natural gas imports dependency rose to almost 40%. A few words on uh, renewable energy, which has been increasing uh, both in China and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S., but uh, when uh, the uh, uh, renewable energy increased by a factor of four in the U.S., it increased in the same period by a factor of 30 in China, and 40% of global investment in renewable energy are done in China, and you know that uh, four Chinese uh, companies are amongst the five biggest producers of solar panels, which was not the case at all 10 years ago. <coughs> <coughs> the geopolitics of oil and gas experience during this period, the game changer of non-conventional uh, hydrocarbons in the U.S. And thanks to shale revolution, oil, oil, U.S. oil production increased by a factor of two, despite the drop of oil prices. And the U.S. are now the first pro producer of petroleum ahead of Russia and Saudi Arabia. Gas production increased by a factor of 40, and the U.S. became a net uh, exporter of gas. And thanks to the shale oil and gas revolution, energy, U.S. energy dependence has fallen from 29% in 2007 to only 8% in 2017. This is opening, uh, opening wide opportunities for the U.S. diplomacy, as it is explained clearly in uh, Trump's America First energy plan. The clear objective is to make America energy independent, and the energy independence of Obama has been replaced by an energy dominance. And I quote one of Trump's tweet, 
American energy dominance is a strategic economic and foreign policy goal for the United States. The U.S. wants to become and stay totally independent of any need to import energy from the OPEC cartel or any nation hostile to our interest. So it is not surprising that energy is also at the core of the Trump war between uh, China and the, uh, uh, the Trump-led war with China. I just remind you that uh, it started in March and June uh, 2018 when the U.S. imposed the tariffs or quotas on steel and aluminum. And uh, then in July and August, the U.S. began imposing tariffs on 50 billion uh, of Chinese industrial goods on the ground of unfair trade practices, as China has re, re, uh, re, retaliated with tit for that, that measures, President Trump has imposed tariffs on 200 billion in Chinese goods and has threatened uh, to tariff all Chinese imported goods. During this escalation, energy product has been included by China, such as LNG or coal. As China domestic energy consumption has grown, the, con the country has become a significant destination of U.S. E energy export. China has taken a large share of incremental volume of U.S. LTO and emerged as the second largest buyer of U.S. crude in 2017. But despite this dramatic increase, the U.S. accounts for less than 3% of Chinese crude imports. As the global market is fungible, China would likely replace the lost U.S. barrels for its top sellers, Russia or Saudi Arabia. And clearly, China will also continue to import Iranian crude despite the U.S. embargo. So, in the short term, the biggest winners of an oil trade war between the U.S. and China would be OPEC and Russia, which is quite surprising. China has retaliated uh, to the U.S. tariffs by imposing, amongst others, a 10% tariff on U.S. LNG. The U.S. is becoming the third largest LNG uh, exporting country by capacity, but currently the U.S. is not a major supplier of LNG to China. The U.S. represents less than 4% of total Chinese LNG imports in 2017, and the trade conflict could, however, have a significant impact on the new wave of U.S. LNG uh, project. The Chinese tariffs may delay or even stall some U.S. LNG projects and slow down the expansion of U.S. LNG exports. China will not lack alternative sources. A cut in U.S. LNG imports by China will open the door further to cooperation with Russia. Other energy exporters will benefit, such as Qatar, Papua New Guinea, or Australia and Canada, and the recent FID taken by LNG Canada clearly targets Asian and China's market. Since August 23, China has imposed an additional 25% import tariff on U.S. coal. In 2017, China imported, in fact, 3 million tons of U.S. coal, representing only 1% of total Chinese import and almost nothing in its total consumption. So the impact of the tariffs will be minor. On the U.S. side, China accounted for only 5% of U.S. coal export. But uh, the effect of China's tariffs on the U.S. coal industry can be seen, in fact, as a missed opportunity for U.S. miners as the Chinese market was a potential outlet for U.S. coal. Trump decided also to impose on, on top of a quota of 2.5 gigawatts of import free uh, of duty, 30% uh, tariff on solar panels. The objective was to stimulate the creation of new jobs in the U.S. Some new factories will be built, uh, creating some jobs. 
However, the impact of, uh, on the downstream industry will be significant. That's why the Solar Energy Industry Association uh, were opposed to tariffs. Developers have since reported the cancellation of freeze of more than 2.5 billion in large projects. Let's add two additional impact for the, oil, uh, for the uh, energy industry in the US the imposition of uh, tariffs on imported steel will have an indirect impact on the U.S. oil and gas industry and prices of U U.S. steel products have soared. So these have a significant impact in, uh, the, for the oil, and, uh, the oil and gas industry and also that's why the oil and gas executive expressed their opposition to the tariffs. But don't we can't ignore the fact that the trade war may have an indirect impact on energy mar market and that there is a risk that the current trade tension escalate further would have an adverse effect on confidence, asset prices and investment and impact, in fact, the economic growth. Lower economic growth would in turn reduce the pace of increase of crude oil and energy demand, and the, this is the last potential impact of this uh, uh, trade war between China and the U.S. Okay. Thank you, Olivier. Just one small question to you. You said that uh, China will continue buy oil from Iran. Do you think China will increase the volume of importation or decrease with this trade uh, war between U.S. and China may have certain impact. Will China try to do a deal to reduce the oil importation or just battle by increasing the importation of oil from Iran? Which do you think China will take? I'm convinced that uh, China does not care about the embargo and uh, in fact due to the war, the trade war between China and the U.S., they will continue to import and even increase their imports. Uh, what could be the retaliation measures? The retaliation measures, as explained by uh, Trichet uh, just uh, before, are detrimental for Western companies. And that's why Total, for example, decided to, uh, to drop from uh, uh, sparse LNG-11. But what could be the retaliation measures of the DOG or the, the uh, U.S. government towards uh, the Chinese company. And by the way, I'm convinced that the Chinese, the Communist Party in Beijing will urge companies to oppose any, uh, any uh, decision of the U.S. Is there any Chinese participants in, in here to comment? Maybe not. Okay, well, maybe we may back to this Iranian issue uh, maybe later, but let's move to Leila. Thank you, Tanaka-san. Um, uh, well, we are on the second day of uh, the, the World Policy Conference, the end of the second day, so I will not uh, insist again on the fact that the global context has changed again over the last decade and I think and I have some slides actually that needs to be that they need to be projected but uh, thank you um, and, and after I think the very comprehensive and, and excellent uh, uh, picture that Olivier has shared with us on all the the aspects that have changed over the last decade I'll just focus on a couple of points some couple of subtle trends that are that have been changing over the last 10 years but not going a little bit more unnoticed than the rest um, should we wait for the slides or should I just proceed is, is the slide coming it's coming but you can talk all right. So uh, the, the first point that I wanted to mention, I mean, uh, Mr. Bakuri over lunchtime has uh, rightly pointed out that, uh, for example, PV, uh, solar PV module costs have decreased uh, uh, over time. So they have actually dropped 80% between 2010 and 2017. That's a massive drop. Uh, but I would really want to insist on another uh, cost decrease that is happening in the energy sector, which is related to storage, electricity storage. Uh, and
and that's, I agree, mostly driven by, by EVs, uh, EV batteries. But at the same time, I mean, it's quite important to mention those cost drops that we've seen in the battery, in the, including in stationary applications, the grid scale batteries. Um, so, um, Electric storage storage in, in, in general have been decreasing 60 to 80 percent since 2010, uh, and they are expected to drop by the various uh, agencies, uh, investment banks, and, uh, and researchers by an additional 50 to 60 percent by 2030. But I really want to point out the large uncertainty uh, that is prevailing in these outlooks. Large uncertainty because we don't know which technology will prevail, we don't know which chemistry is going to prevail, we don't know how much money, R&D money, will, will, will be put uh, in, in those technologies, where the manufacturing capabilities will be, uh, will be uh, focused in, uh, or concentrated in the next few years, and of course, government support. How will government support will evolve over, over time? But I think it's fair to say that we, we can see some additional cost decreases uh, in, in energy storage as well uh, in, in, in a wider sense. The implication for me or the implication for uh, any energy player in, in, in the scene, uh, companies and countries alike, is a race. A race to gain leadership in technologies and beyond that, a race to secure access to the materials and commodities that are underlying these uh, storage technologies. And I will give uh, some, some, some examples later on. The second point, the second subtle, subtle change that uh, I am seeing, at least in, in, the, in, in the energy sector over the last decade, I mean, of course, there has been an unprecedented volatility in oil prices, and, and, and it has been widely documented in press, and we all know about it, when oil prices uh, increased to $140 in 2008 before dropping to $20 to $30. And now we are in that 70 to 80 uh, uh, band uh, uh, around that. So here again, uh, we would argue, I mean, any planner would argue that this is just another commodity cycle and, and nobody really likes uh, commodity cycles. And, and it's an uncertainty that, uncertainty that we have to live with, and I think the industry has been uh, uh, very used to live with this uh, some sort of uncertainty. But the implication of these uh, volatility is, I think, every planner's nightmare. We are today in a situation where uh, oil demand outlooks can go from, I mean, today's market of around 100 million barrels a day, to anywhere between, I mean, it can increase to 80 million barrels a day by 2040, or grow, increase to 112, 150 million barrels a day. Uh, when you are in an industry with, with huge capital investment programs, it's, 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 a, it's really a nightmare to be able to, to plan in those circumstances. So today, that gives another type of race as well, race for cost leadership, a race for prof profitability, but also a race to guarantee some sort of security of demand. And that security of demand is slightly different from the traditional definition of security of demand that we have seen over, I would say, the last two decades in, in, in the oil markets. We are seeing today a lot of several players investing in, uh, in uh, uh, securing demand for oil and gas in established markets. So you invest in making sure that the IC engines uh, continue to be uh, the engines of the future for, for sustainable transport. You continue to, to, to invest in low emission fuels, uh, and in onboard CO2 capture, we see that in the heavy-duty vehicles, in the shipping industry as well, we are seeing a lot, of, a lot of changes happening there in those established markets. But you also see another trend in uh, a race to capture market share in new markets for, uh, for, for crude and gas. And um, I'm thinking here about, of course, petrochemicals, plastics, polymers for, for, for crude and for oil products in general, and, um, and in tra transportation for gas. Um, and in this context, um, there will be, uh, in this, the discussion to prepare this, this panel, we talked a lot about rivalries, and I prefer to use the word uh, shifting alliances. So there will be a lot of shifting alliances. There will be a lot of, uh, I would say, proactive strategies. I prefer to use this word. Uh, but, and we should not forget that in addition to the traditional alliances that we are used to in, in, in this, here again, highly capital-intensive sector, uh, the alliances today, in many cases, are being driven by large corporations, private corporations, but also large, increasingly large sovereign funds, uh, other national champions of new forms, uh, and 
national oil companies, large national oil companies, which in many cases are being perceived as competing with each other because they are pursuing similar objectives uh, and similar strategies. They all want business integration. Uh, they all want downstream investments. They all want global footprint because there's a limit to what you can achieve in your domestic market. It's, there's a limit to what you can sell in the, your domestic market, and there's, especially if you are heavily exposed to mature domestic assets. So. Um, these pro proactive strategies that I've, that I've been talking about, or those uh, shifting alliances, are driven by these three key aspects. Uh, the first one is, as I mentioned, the, the, the race uh, to secure market share by making sure that we, are, or that we continue to be low cost as much as possible. And uh, through, uh, of course, optimal extraction of resources, uh, an increasingly important capital discipline, especially after the volatility of oil prices that we have seen, uh, and of, in, in, in addition to the, to the low cost position, uh, this would be coupled increasingly with the low carbon intensity of some operations. So you put that in a melting pot and uh, the conclusion is that, uh, uh, of course, the Russians and the Middle Eastern NOCs are very well positioned because to take advantage of their low cost position, we are talking about two to four dollars per barrel of oil equivalent uh, uh, in, for, for development and production costs. There will be a bigger challenge, of course, for Latin Americans, Asian NOCs, uh, because simply their, their, their costs are more than double that. Or for Canadian players, which are uh, disadvantaged by their, the carbon intensity of their uh, upstream operations. One word on capital discipline. I, I, I mentioned um, I mean, spending rates uh, in the industry have been scaled back in the wider industry by NOCs and IOCs, majors uh, all alike. Uh, and we've seen cuts in exploration budgets, which, and I will trigger, and I will talk about it a little bit later on in my conclusion, uh, it might be tr triggering another uh, commodity cycle that uh, none of us actually like in the end. Uh, but most of the national oil companies today are investing at higher rates than, than the majors. And, but in general, I think it's quite important to mention here, just a, a caveat, that apart from CNOC, uh, Petronas, and uh, Sinopec, investments of no, most national oil companies are very much focused on, on domestic projects and, and domestic markets. And this is the reason why you see now this rapprochement that uh, Olivier has mentioned between uh, the Russians, which are differentiated by, their, by the scale, by their portfolio longevity, uh, uh, and the Russians, which are now courting uh, national oil companies from the Middle East, while you have the Asian national oil companies still focusing very much in the short term on resource capture initiatives, but not any, at any price. And we have several examples in the headlines. I mean, you're all aware of uh, uh, the OPEC plus uh, alliance, uh, the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and, 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 and Russia, uh, several investments or potential investments uh, in, in the international gas uh, industry. Uh, Qatar emerging as a major shareholder in Rosneft, that's another example, 18.95% uh, 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 in the $9 billion deal because the talks with the China, China's uh, CEFC have collapsed. So these are all examples in the headline that sort of support this uh, uh, hypothesis that I, that I presented here. Um, and since we are talking about market share, uh, I thought it was, it was quite important to say a word about the chemicals business more, more specifically. Because that, that, there's a question that, that I very often get is, why uh, is the chemical business increasingly considered in integration with, with, with refining capacity, with downstream investments? And one example is Saudi Arabia aiming to increase refining uh, capacity to 8 to 10 million barrels a day and to double the pet chem capacity by 2030. Here, um, the scale of, of the investments definitely has a weight in, in the market of, of some key uh, petrochemical products but also potentially it raises some concerns uh, around the long-term financial performance of, of, of the business. Because the issue that we are facing is that in many cases, uh, the return on capital employed of uh, a petrochemical project or a chemical project is registered single digit percentages, while the industry, as we all know, prefers to have 15% uh, returns usually. So the integration with refining becomes uh, very valuable and very important. 
uh, we need uh, much more capital discipline in, in the area. And uh, in, in the basket of, of opportunities, uh, it would be also great to add some quick wins in terms of merger and acquisitions to be able to build this uh, sustainable chemicals business coupled with, uh, with, with refining. But these are the, really the only ways that, that we could see to improve the financial performance of, of, of this important business for the, for the oil industry. The upside, uh, is that market access uh, to the same demand growth centers uh, targeted by oil and gas, namely China, India, Southeast Asia, etc., uh, really facilitates the building of uh, brands, the building of presence, which is much more important in the petrochemical industry. Uh, and it, it also facilitates strategic partnerships uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with major uh, corporations in those countries. But we still need, and I think the industry is, is uh, realizing that we really need large marketing efforts, uh, large branding efforts to be able to, able, to, be able to establish a presence, a uh, sustainable presence in this important market for crude. Um, and the third race that I mentioned in my introduction was around the technologies and commodities. Uh, we are faced in a situation, I use the example of energy storage, uh, where uh, many countries and companies are, are, are engaged in a race to secure the minerals and materials to take leadership in uh, clean, and, uh, clean and storage technologies. So, for example, I mean, it was already mentioned a few times that China has been leading global investments in uh, renewable energy. We all know that. What has been less documented is that uh, the, the country has been quite aggressive in its uh, race to uh, dominate in energy storage as well. So, for example, and now it's very clear, uh, by the end of 2017, the country has issued uh, a unified nationwide policy to boost the energy storage industry in the country. So, to give you just some order of magnitude, the Chinese uh, industrial capacity at the end of last year was around 389 megawatt. And between in January and June of this year, so during six months of this year, uh, they put in place new uh, energy storage projects of around 340 megawatts. So we are doubling the capacity in six months. And that's across the country in, in, in various prov provinces, including Guangdong, including, including Jiangsu, etc. Uh, one word about the technologies themselves, I mean, apart from pump hydro, where uh, uh, we, we have many countries that have uh, installed them uh, over the years, uh, the three key other families, lithium-ion, flow batteries, and high temperatures, they all have this large cost reduction potential that I mentioned earlier, with the caveat that they, it comes with a large uncertainty. Uh, so, for example, lithium-ion batteries for stationary applications uh, could drop uh, up to 60% 60, 60 by 2030. And that will depend a lot on, on which battery chemistry we are following. But the stationary applications, and I insist on that, have much higher costs than the EV applications because you need uh, battery management system, systems, you need more hardware for the stationary applications. But they are benefiting, of course, from the growth in the EV industry. And. Uh, the flow batteries, and these are my, my personal favorites, uh, uh, not only because of the beautiful colors that we see in a vanadium flow battery, uh, these uh, batteries can actually drop, their cost can actually drop two-thirds between now and 2030. Here again, uh, huge uncertainty, but the beauty of flow batteries and that is that they are independ independently scalable, and, uh, so, and the, the power and energy storage capacity characteristics make them very much scalable and modulable, uh, which makes them very well applicable for, uh, for uh, grid-scale solutions. But all this, all this rosy picture of cost decreases comes at a price, and the price that I wanted to highlight here is the minerals that uh, uh, and, and uh, commodities that uh, are on which these technologies are dependent on. So the issue that we have today is that this, all the technologies, uh, all the uh, technologies around uh, energy storage, revolves around just a few key commodities. Um, we we have the NMC, the nickel, manganese, cobalt. We have copper, lithium, of course, graphite, zinc, and now increasingly vanadium. Copper and nickel are already key industrial materials, uh, key industrial metals which are traded on commodities, commodities exchanges, and consumers are very much uh, used to uh, managing supply risks. 
uh, manganese and graphite supplies are available in sufficient quantities, but the issue now is really around cobalt, and you see in my slide uh, the price vol volatility uh, in, in cobalt and lithium, uh, because these, there are major concerns, as we, as we know, uh, around uh, security of supply for those uh, two commodities. And, and, and cobalt primarily is driving some countries' strategies, including China, and China's uh, aggressive investments in uh, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, where 60% of supplies of cobalt are, are, are concentrated, uh, uh, is quite key there. But it comes, uh, as we know, with political instability, with uh, conflicts over mineral issues, etc. So even if we, the industries and uh, the industry and the uh, the research and development in the energy storage is trying as much as possible to reduce its dependence towards cobalt and, and other uh, key commodities there by switching to uh, less cobalt-rich cathodes on, or trying other, uh, other alternatives. The, 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 the five leading lithium-ion ba battery uh, manufacturers that Mr. Carlos Gon has referred to uh, are definitely de still dependent a lot on cobalt supplies. So, um, in conclusion, uh, you know, we talked about the U.S., Russia, Middle East, China, a little bit about the, the, the EU as well. I mean, of course, there, are a lot of, there is a lot of repositioning and alliances and change in alliances in, in today's world. But I think it's quite important to mention that there is still a continuous uh, emphasis and a continuous focus on the key fundamentals, which is growth, profitability, and increasingly trying to have a proactive technology strategy because uh, th that's really a must for the future. One key area that has been neglected so far, and, uh, and, and I would like to, to, to finish on that, is really system flexibility, more than, more than, much more than system security, actually. And, uh, and I see that, and I've been an advocate, actually, myself, of, of the LNG industry as well because uh, it's bringing liquefied gas from the other side of the world, uh, frozen at minus 162 degrees Celsius, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit, is a beautiful uh, technical challenge. It's a beautiful commercial challenge. Uh, but it does not necessarily answer uh, the, the, the issue of system flexibility, simply because the market mechanisms that, that we have today are not mature enough to reward system flexibility. Uh, we still have pricing mismatch, we still have arbitrage. Uh, that the, the traders and the industry is, 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 is taking advantage of, and we still have market inefficiencies that hampers uh, uh, energy system flexibility to be properly rewarded. So ideally, we want to have more tradability, more connectivity between between regions, between neighboring countries, and with global markets. And that, then there's no secret there. We need more investment in infrastructure, in midstream and downstream infrastructure for that. So that's why I, I focused, surprisingly, most of my presentation on, on storage, because there is a growing awareness in the industry, whether we like it or not, that energy storage is, is of incredible and paramount importance. Uh, because we, I mean, in, in the country where I'm based, there's a large swing of demand, for example. You see in many other countries a massive introduction of renewable uh, energy. Uh, and in many cases, this questions the large capital investment programs in the oil and gas part of the industry. And that creates another commodity cycle, another cycle of volatility that is definitely not in the interest of the producers and not in the interest, interest of the consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Very good presentation. Um, one point, I, I want to ask you that uh, IA3 agree with uh, many of the points you uh, raised. Uh, for example, the industrial use of uh, gas and oil will increase rather than fuel. Um, uh, the future of the gas, for example, it's not the fuel for the power generation. It's going to be the petrochemical as an input. So, uh, and also, I understand that for the storage, is Saudi Aramco serious about using hydrogen as a possible way of storage of the clean source of hydrocarbon, I mean, I mean uh, non-carbon non uh, fuel? Uh, I talked with uh, some of uh, the CTO of Saudi Aramco that uh, taking out the carbon dioxide and put underground as an enhanced oil recovery uh, is a capture and storage. So the hydrogen becomes the clean source. So by doing so, uh, exporting clean oil 
as hydrogen is one of the technological options for Saudi Aramco. Is, is, are you seriously thinking of this option? Um, uh, here, I'm, I am not speaking in my, in my capacity as, uh, as Saudi Aramco okay, here, so I, I, will not, I will not make a comment on that. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, I can only comment on what the industry is doing uh, on that, and, and there, are, there are many, many initiatives. O OGCI is one of them, uh, and I think a lot of the players in the industry are, are quite serious in, in investing as much as possible, as I, as I mentioned earlier, to reduce, uh, to, to try to uh, preserve uh, market share in, in established markets as, as, as much as possible, uh, uh, and, and including capturing CO2 in, in multiple applications. That's, that's all what I can say okay, on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to uh, Richard Cooper. <clears throat> Our session is called uh, Energy and Climate Change, and I just want to remind everyone that while these two issues are closely related, climate change is due to more than energy, and in particular, roughly speaking, one quarter of greenhouse gases comes from agriculture and changes in land use. And so when we think about climate change, we should not only think about energy. We have to think about energy is important, but we have to think about uh, other sources of greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, we all heard last night uh, Laurent Fabius talk to us about uh, uh, the urgency of dealing with climate change, according to him, and he's been involved in an intimate way now for at least 10 years. Um, he uh, reported on the latest IPCC report, um, which I have not read. I've only learned about it from a few uh, newspaper articles and what he said last night. Uh, but it, uh, two things surprised me about uh, what I have not read, but have heard about. Uh, one is its specificity. I followed the science of climate change for at least two decades, and uh, as an interested observer, not as a scientist. And um, there's still huge uncertainties, including the sensitive sensitivity, it's called, of the climate itself to greenhouse gas concentrations in the climate. They have not changed in 25 years. One and a half degrees centigrade to four and a half degrees centigrade for a doubling of CO2 from uh, roughly 1800. Um, so we've invested tens of billions of dollars in research on climate change. We know much more than we did 20 years ago. And one of the things we know is how complicated the Earth's atmosphere and oceans are. Uh, so that in spite of all of this greater research, and we're much better informed on individual pieces, we still do not have an accurate overview of uh, climate change and its relation to greenhouse gas emissions. So I was given that background, I was surprised at the specificity that was reported, at least, uh, again, I haven't read the report, but uh, reported in the newspapers and in Fabius's uh, speech last night. And uh, in order to get, get that specificity, they had to make a lot of assumptions about things that we actually don't know about. They may be completely right in those assumptions. I don't have a judgment on it, but they may be also badly wrong. And so we should not take that as firm knowledge about the climate, um, even from the accomplished scientists. The other thing that surprised me, this, this is uh, again from newspaper articles and Fabius' speech, is the degree of urgency which was uh, conveyed apparently to the readers of the report, um, and maybe by the report itself, and uh, statements about 2030. And I will just say flatly, as a practicing economist for a half a century, that uh, that will not happen. 
by 2030. So we should get it out of our heads that no, we're not going to turn society over on the, uh, around the world over the issue of climate change. It's not, just not going to happen. Now what might happen is that we overshoot and then technological improvements permit us to go back down to two, that one and a half. I don't rule that out. But the notion of stabilizing the uh, average temperature increase at one and a half degrees centigrade by 2030 is just out of the question in my view. Um, and um, uh, so we need to think about uh, much more actively if, if the scientists are right in, the, in what they say, much more actively about adaptation along many, many different fronts, not just building seawalls, <laughs> but with biodiversity and so forth. The human agency can uh, adapt the, uh, of all of the species. The most adaptable are probably human beings, some ants, and some bacteria. Uh, but the human beings have an enormous capacity for adaptation to change, particularly if there's notice about when the change is coming, as we have increasingly. Um, uh, so I think it's, um, I guess I would say, bad politics to urge strongly that we do something that's going to be impossible. That sounds like Mr. Trump. He actually has some things in mind, not climate change, but other things which I think are possible. Um, now, my view on the trajectory, um, sp sp talking just about the energy side, I know that a number of environmentalists, at least in the United States and I gather in Europe, also deeply regret the shale gas revolution on the grounds that it's another fossil fuel and it uh, generates greenhouse gases. And of course they are correct in their factual statement, but per unit of useful energy, uh, natural gas in producing electricity produces about half the greenhouse gases as coal does. So the, um, uh, my trajectory for the, not the next decade, because I think it's impossible, but say for the next three decades, is uh, natural gas as the bridging incremental fuel and solar as the ultimate source of energy supplemented by wind and other things, ge geothermal, but the main source will be solar. And if we've heard from the previous presentations, the uh, uh, cost of solar energy has come down dramatically uh, just within the last um, decade. And so basically in the short run, uh, the thing we need to do is, above all, prevent the building of new coal-fired power plants, That's, uh, uh, which is strongly uh, 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 against climate change and, of course, heavily polluting. And then there's the question of what we do with existing power plants, those that ha still have economic value, and uh, that's an issue certainly for private firms, as in the United States and some other countries, but even for state ownership of uh, coal-fired power plants. And that's a, uh, an important budgetary decision. Uh, do the coal-fired power plants, which have very low operating costs, once the capital costs have been incurred, and they last for 40 or 50 years, uh, are they going to be taken out of production? And can we have an international agreement on that? Probably not. Can we have an international understanding that it would be desirable? Probably uh, feasible, leaving aside Mr. Trump for the moment. Um, and, um, and then it would be up to individual countries uh, whether the extent to which they accelerate the um, uh, shutting down of existing coal-fired power plants. But above all, we have to stop building new ones. And uh, 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 we have not built any coal-fired, uh, coal is still very important in the United States, but we have not built any new plants 
for the last 35 years. Uh, all the incremental power has been uh, achieved by natural gas, which has much it's higher operating costs, but much lower capital costs uh, to build. And uh, we've expanded some existing coal-fired plants, but we've built no new ones. And uh, all, as I say, all of the incremental, uh, apart from a modest amount of solar and wind and those, uh, those renewables. Um, and, um, and then if the, uh, we're bridging a period with natural gas to solar, the issue comes up, which has been emphasized by uh, our previous speaker, uh, electricity storage. I'm glad she did not use the word batteries because batteries are one form of electricity storage, chemical storage basically, uh, but there are other forms of electric storage. Batteries, uh, what we could call batteries in general, are perhaps necessary for electric vehicles uh, uh, which move around, uh, but they're not necessary for stationary sources of power. And the true traditional ways of storing electricity, uh, think of wind and solar when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, um, are pumping water. And uh, of course that only works if you have a lot of water, which you can pump and um, flywheels. Flywheels have been understood for many, many years. They're relatively cheap to build. To build a really first class one requires special materials, but to build ordinary ones are cheap to build and you can imagine under any uh, wind uh, turbine or a collection of wind turbines, uh, flywheels uh, around which store the electricity and which can be drawn on uh, during when the wind is not uh, blowing. Um, uh, 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 for mobile uh, things like cars and trucks and airplanes, uh, of course batteries are, uh, uh, are much more important in the traditional sense and probably mostly chemical unless we go to hydrogen as a um, fuel. Uh, I have long favored, under the heading of climate change, uh, nuclear power. So I'm not a conventional environmentalist in that sense. Uh, but as we've saw, seen today, uh, nuclear power is now outclassed in terms of cost unless we get uh, new, uh, smaller, modular uh, nuclear power plants which have been designed down the river from me at MIT and in other places, we, we, we have not seen them yet in commercial use. And so they remain to be uh, tested. I saw recently a press report on fusion saying that fusion, practical fusion, commercial fusion was uh, five years away. I'm old enough to know that uh, it's been said that fusion was just within a two decades since the mid-1950s, and I simply don't believe it. Believe it. Um, yeah. And I'm not willing to put more money in it but, uh, as a taxpayer, uh, but uh, some people are apparently, so we're still working on fusing, uh, but I don't see fusion as a practical uh, um, operation in this. And I guess in uh, talking about timing, I'm persuaded of the tremendous inertia in human affairs, uh, even in a rapidly growing economy like China, uh, and now India, and more slowly growing in Europe and the United States. Um, we have a lot of legacy uh, capital stock, very large, uh, in the uh, United States and Europe, but uh, uh, even in China, uh, we heard in uh, an interview today that there are now nine million cars in the, United, in the world um, from Goshen, nine million cars. In the United States, the average car lasts uh, eight 
years. That's the average. I drove a car once for 14 years from the time it was made until the time I sold it, actually. Didn't junk it, I sold it. Uh, so uh, think about converting uh, those 9 million cars, all internal combustion engines, into uh, uh, climate change friendly vehicles. If we were to stop producing internal combustion engines this year, and from January on produced only electric cars, only electric cars, it would take uh, uh, nearly two decades to replace the outstanding stock of cars, and there are also trucks and other um, vehicles. Um, and then I want to remind everyone, I'm sure everyone knows here, you cannot just look at the vehicles that are electric, you have to look behind it to how the electricity was generated. And we still generate um, most of our electricity with fossil fuels. And uh, so you have to look at the entire cycle and not just the fact that the car is uh, electric. Let me say a word about uh, Mr. Trump and his uh, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. It happened by coincidence. He, he announced his intention to withdraw uh, in June of 2017. And as you probably know, it actually takes three years to formally withdraw. So he announced his intention to withdraw. Uh, two weeks later, we had an annual conference of mayors, uh, it's an annual conference, two weeks later, representing 1,400 cities, uh, all of the largest cities in the United States. And the conference of mayors, Republicans and Democrats, voted overwhelmingly that they were not giving up on addressing climate change. Now, it has to be said that many cities do not have a climate change policy. But uh, surprisingly, perhaps, many U.S. cities, including mine, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, do have a climate policy. And the Conference of Mayors, in direct reaction to Tr Trump's announcement, have uh, announced that they were going to carry on. And of course, we know some states, California uh, up front, but that includes Massachusetts and other uh, U.S. states, are going to carry on with climate change. And the time dimension of this uh, issue, problem, challenge, is such that um, Trump will come and go uh, before it's been solved uh, seriously. And so uh, I do not, uh, Trump can do a lot of damage as uh, president, but it's not mainly in this area. Things are going to carry on. They're going to be driven mainly by market phenomenon. Well, we've talked about the changing cost structure for solar and, and uh, uh, wind and nuclear and coal. Um, and um, so I, I'm, I, that, that's not high on my priority list of things that uh, the damage that Trump um, um, can actually do. Um, well, I, I have uh, lots more I can say, but that's probably time to stop and we can talk about other things in conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, as you say, this uh, IPCC's 1.5 degree C special report was uh, just uh, released and uh, they are very uh, kind of uh, um, ambitious or really surprisingly tough and speci uh, very specificity there. Uh, and to make um, net zero emission by 2050 is necessary and and uh, compared to the two degrees Celsius scenario, we need three times or four times more investment needed. And uh, as you say, if overshooting happens, uh, definitely the carbon capture and storage or usage will be the key technology right. to achieve uh, net zero emission by that time. So, so carbon storage and capture is, is really uh, technologies there, but without carbon price or carbon tax or some kind of penalty on carbon. This is very difficult. So the United States uh, uh, in, in some companies has carbon pricing and, and reducing the carbon contents. 
But this carbon capture technology, it's only possible in Saudi Arabia or this oil producing country as an enhanced oil recovery. But just burning coal and take out carbon dioxide and, and put it underground is probably almost impossible. So now the other technology, direct carbon capture from the air is also discussed. So the thing is, but this is an, an, another very high cost. Um, other things is, yes, battery of the electric vehicle as a system. If there's a millions of uh, electric vehicles on, uh, uh, on the market or on the street, that they could be connected and they can provide the gigawatts of storage as a system. So that is the, one of the uh, Chinese strategy or some of the uh, EV com companies are uh, thinking about. It's a digitalization and connectivity solve part of this storage problem. Fusion, interesting. I learned some of the fusion company in the United States are really ambitious and some money venture capitalists put in. I hope one of them may work, but uh, we'll see. Um, that's, that's a part of my comment, but let's move to uh, Masuda-san from the Japanese perspective. Uh, thank you very much. I just follow on what uh, Olivia Pell said, but I don't follow my, my text prepared because almost good things have been uh, consumed by this time. Just uh, how I see the tension between China and the United States from Japanese eye, and the same time I'm a historian since uh, the Roman Empire, so I see, put it in a long perspective. This is uh, my feeling. Uh, as I inter made intervention yesterday, in 1980-50, the 50% 50 of, or more of world GDP was produced by just two countries, that is India and uh, uh, China. And if history may repeat itself, the rise of China is inevitable cause. My feeling is that probably the US people, top people with sensitivity, has realized the creeping shadow of China, which is accelerating its speed, and they have an uneasy feeling. Don't, I don't say fear, of they could be overtaken by China, inevitably. So before China rise to, to much bigger than the United States, unable to even touch fingers on that, they like to everything to slow down or de deter the course of Chinese growth. This is a very basic uh, sentiment uh, of the U.S., which is not the only the product for Donald Trump. In energy scene, a lot of things have been ongoing, and uh, China may have no problem in securing uh, fossil fuel energy, as Olivia Pell said. Already, China has taken initiative to increase import from Qatar of LNG, and also recently, China agreed, made an agreement with Total to increase its procurement from Total from 1 million ton per year to 1.5 million. And oil scene, China was the largest import of U U.S. oil in May this year, but proportion, uh, percentage in Chinese import is not so big, and they have no problem in that. But as for coal, there is a problem. Yes, China is... Uh, best student in, in dealing with coal, at least albeit for the last few years, but what is doing in the name of One Belt, One Road is Chinese intensively exporting its coal-fired plant technology to One Belt, One Road countries. There's interesting data. Today, about 130 coal-fired plants are built under the Chinese initiative in those countries are new. New coal fire plants, not necessarily using the state of art uh, clean coal technology. And uh, if you look back from 2000 to 2016, China led construction of roughly 240 coal fired power plants project in those areas as well. So China is making home green and exporting 
black things abroad. This is what's happening. And, uh, but in climate policy perspective, China is consolidating the leading position in both the deployment of renewable energy and establishment of the world's largest carbon market. Instantly, a friend of mine, academic in China, is designing this uh, largest carbon market, which seems to be working well because of the size involved. So China would be the leader in those two areas. And uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why China is so successful in renewable energy is not just because of government drive to clean the economy. It's coming from, like in the United States, sheer competition among many participants. For example, in clean tech company in China, there was roughly 2,700 in 2005, 2005. Now, in 2015, 10 years later, the number increased over 50,000. And today, that number is bigger. And they are competing very fiercely with each other because of the size of the market again. And support, plus government support, that naturally led China to be the leader but in those areas. China has a clear advantage in technological development. Number one, because of firewall around it. Number two, when Western companies come to China, China wants them to bring the state of art technologies and ask them to review all secret and softwares and hardwares they own. So this is one of the reasons why China is so fast in developing batteries. I, I went to China uh, last year and met uh, several PhDs who are working on um, batteries, and they are so proud to say, they said, honestly, we are well behind America and Japan and Korea in terms of batteries, but we have a fleet of 300 PhDs only on battery, and in a matter of few years from now, we're going to be the champion in terms of technology, in terms of size of deployment into the market. In, in terms of uh, electric vehicles, yes, China is a champion. For example, in 2017, there's about global one million new EV has been deployed to the market in the world, and more than 50% only in China. And if you talk about uh, global EV stocks, 40% of global stocks are now in China. And uh, in terms of uh, other technologies, China is a champion already artificial intelligence for, for various reasons. But one of the scary stories, just aside from climate and energy issues, is China is using this for social surveillance, uh, using those AI. And they are quietly exporting this technology to some autocratic countries, like uh, some big country in desert. Just a few footnotes on EV. I'm, I'm just quite you know, stimulated by the discussion we had about solar panel. Yes, solar panel energy is good. Uh, solar energy is good. Photovoltaic will be champion in coming years. But we are forgetting one side, negative side of deployment of massive amount of solar panels. How much energy do you think we need? How much environmental externalities coming from purifying and crystallizing silicones? And that number of question. And solar panels have a lifetime of roughly 20 years. After 20 years, what they do? If they dump them as industrial waste, it causes another serious environmental pollution all over the world. If they completely recycle, use solar panel, the massive cost involved with many countries, the countries bear, they are to bear the cost. It's all already a big problem for Japan and Germany, and most importantly, China and in many other countries who are now rapidly deploying 
solar panels. So we shouldn't forget this downside. Although it's good for climate purposes, if we pollute the entire planet, we are going against the, the, the uh, big uh, common goods of the, of the human race. Lastly, about EV. Because my company is supplying critical parts for EV, let me allow me to say something about EV. EV is pretty good, but as uh, Professor Cooper said, it takes such a long time to replace all these existing fleet of uh, combustion engines. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If you remember a wonderful marriage of uh, uh, Prince Henry, Henry of the UK, he drove blue jaguar out of Windsor Castle. It was converted EV. Conversion of EV is one brilliant idea of increasing EV fleet on the planet. Converting old car is life cycle cost of car making EVs far less because already it's used and more battery provided a cheaper cost and better motor will make conversion of EV a big industry. And I like, I'm dreaming of a world where newly product EV is competing with lovely second-hand EV. That's gonna actually the deployment of EV. So I like to end my stories about a bright future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way, um, you talk about uh, China and coal. What is the Japan's policy about coal? Still, Japan is building the new coal power plant and even try to export the efficient coal plant. What do you think, uh, Japanese policy on coal? I'm, uh, I'm a Japanese. I'm brought up in Meti, but I'm pretending to be a foreigner. And I do not believe the policy held by Japanese utility companies and the government about coal-fired power plant is not something recommended. Japan is still constructing roughly 40 coal-fired power plants, and Japanese banks are very hesitant to stop uh, providing loans to those facilities. So in a way, Japan is 10 years behind than average Western countries in terms of climate change. I don't like to criticize uh, good engineers and having said about clean coal technologies, but maybe it's time for Japan to depart from the old legacy uh, of, of those technologies and maybe should fly high with some lighter technologies. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I cannot agree more, and that's the reason why I asked the question to uh, Carlos Ghosn or Toyota or whoever <coughs> say that these <coughs> renewable energy hundred companies will probably kick coal power plant out of anywhere. That is probably would happen. Yeah. Well, let's move to uh, uh, Radislav. Uh, from the international oil companies viewpoint. Please, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I, thank you. I have a presentation here. What, what basically I'd like to do is to share with you the point of view from an oil and gas company on how we can integrate this uh, climate change uh, issue in the strategy of the company. So it turns as an example, but I think it can be, it can be useful actually to use that as a, a, not necessarily a reference, but at least a, an example. And to set the scene, I, I have to say, well, we're an oil and gas company. We sell oil, gas, electricity. We are part of the problem, no doubt. So we need to be part of the, of the solution. And we take this responsibility very seriously. And the, the, the main difficulty for us, if I want to summarize for your benefit, is on the one hand, we consider our responsibility is to provide energy to people who need it. And it was very clearly stated this morning that energy demand is going to increase. So we have to supply more energy. 
affordable, reliable, clean energy, but more energy. And at the same time, we need to reduce the carbon footprint of the, what we sell to our clients. And so joining the two together turns out to be quite, quite challenging. And on top of that, we have to do that at a profit because we, we're, we're in business. So basically, in, uh, in, uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, I, I'd like to tell you the way we look, we could actually try to achieve this kind of challenge which seems difficult. To do that, we take as a reference the two degree scenario of IE. I don't know whether this scenario is going to happen or not, but at least it's a good reference that we, we use. And when you, when you look at that, that's on the right hand side actually, well, on the, on the left side of the slide, but the right bars, you, uh, I think there are interesting things to note. The first one is that the share of oil, which is in dark blue, is decreasing between 2016 and 2040. But still, oil represents more than 20% of the energy mix. And as you all know, of course, we have to fight against the, the natural decline of uh, oil fields. So at the end, that's quite a significant amount of oil which has to be produced and brought to the market by 2040 in this two degree scenario. Now, if we assume that the uh, still demand for oil over the long run is going to decrease, we cannot uh, ignore the possibility that oil price would, would go down. And this is why it seems to us extremely important as a strategy to take that into account in order to already anticipate that trend and position ourselves on low break-even oil. Second, you see that gas is increasing in, uh, uh, in relative terms and in absolute terms uh, also. So clearly, and I share the views uh, that you mentioned, uh, Richard, that, that probably gas actually, yes, will be uh, 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 an energy that will be needed and demand for gas is increasing significantly. So definitely going and developing our activity uh, along the gas chain does make sense. And finally, of course, you can note that uh, what is called renewable, low carbon electricity is developing very fast as well. So we look at it as, a, as an uh, in energy company, as an opportunity to develop our, uh, our activity. But when we want actually at the same time to reduce the carbon footprint, it's clear that there are many different levers that we have to work on. And for us, it's clear that that's not by just following one path that will manage to improve our, our situation, but that's really by combining different levers together. I mentioned uh, five of them, and I'm going to run you through uh, those ones. The first one is, of course, energy efficiency. Actually, as an oil and gas uh, company, we consume energy. We are very large consumers uh, through the refining or even the production uh, activities. And so by reducing our, our, our own energy needs, by improving our energy efficiency, and I can tell you that's something that I think it's extremely uh, effective in terms of uh, uh, reducing at the end carbon emissions is something critical. The second aspect that uh, I, I want to mention is methane. You know that methane has uh, uh, impact in terms of CO2 equivalent uh, impact, which is much higher than the CO2. So we need also, and uh, OGCI was mentioned, as part of uh, OGCI, we are working with a group of companies to, to reduce actually, or uh, to calculate and reduce our methane emissions. And thirdly, carbon pricing, of course, is absolutely key because if there is no carbon price, there is no way. You talked about CCUS. It's good to be the, the, the last one because you can take everything which had been said already by different people. So I do appreciate that. But it's clear that without any carbon price, uh, it will be extremely difficult to, uh, to develop uh, uh, CO2 battle because, uh, of course, uh, uh, you need to give a price to the negative impact that it can have in order to combine business models with uh, uh, 
uh, carbon uh, fight. So energy efficiency is number one. Clearly, gas is number two, and it seems uh, extremely important as uh, I, I bounce back on something which has been said already, but we have to keep in mind that wood, wood uh, gas replace coal in uh, electricity generation. Of course, this is just, uh, this is difficult to imagine right away, but you mentioned no more coal plants. But if gas was to replace coal, we would save about five gigatons of CO2 emissions, which represents about 10% of what is being emitted worldwide today. So the, the, the objectives would be achieved right away. Of course, that's not going to happen, but that's to give you the, the order of magnitude of how gas can be effective, actually, uh, in particular for power generation, if it was to, to replace uh, coal. Third aspect is uh, low carbon electricity. I'm not talking electricity only, but low carbon electricity, because as it was rightly mentioned, it depends where electricity comes from. But uh, I think that for a company like ours, what is very important is not just to be on one aspect of electricity, but to really develop activities along the chain by producing electricity, trading electricity, selling electricity, and of course, having production coming from either gas through CGGTs or renewables that we want to develop in order to integrate actually this uh, low carbon electricity business. It is a growing business. There are some challenges in terms of economy because uh, sometimes it is challenging, we have to face it, but by integrating along the whole chain, we think that we can actually get uh, uh, decent returns along the chain for this uh, electricity, uh, low carbon electricity uh, business. A fourth aspect that has to be integrated is the biofuels. And here, public policies do help to a certain extent, as there are some uh, red one or more obligations which increase the level of incorporation of biofuels in uh, gasoline or uh, diesel. And you see from the past that actually demand for uh, biofuels has increased quite significantly. And so it's also an area that will develop further and uh, that we should capitalize uh, on. Well, as a matter of fact, we are first uh, uh, distributor of uh, biofuels in, uh, in Europe and produce biofuels ourselves. Uh, so that's uh, an area also that we see as an opportunity to uh, develop uh, further. Finally, and maybe more over the, uh, the longer run, but there is this issue of getting to net zero emission in the second half of the, the century. No doubt that this cannot be achieved without uh, negative emissions, compensation. And we should see two of them. One, of course, is CCUS. And again, uh, we, we, uh, for us, we, we spend quite some money, 10% of our R&D uh, programs in CCUS. But again, what is absolutely critical is to have a carbon price in order to promote a business uh, model for, uh, for CCUS. The other one being natural things like uh, forests, where also uh, there are some efforts to be made. And uh, we initiated actually some, uh, some programs through our foundation. But what I want to, to get at is that at the end, I'm going to drop that one, it's, it's probably too, uh, too detailed, that by combining all these different levers together, we do genuinely believe that an oil and gas company like uh, ours can decrease gradually the carbon intensity of the energy products that we sell to our customers. And at the end, what counts is to be in a position to, to provide a service, to provide some products which have, for the same amount of energy, a lower uh, in a carbon intensity. And, and you see, we've uh, defined, actually, that's an example, but that's, uh, for us, 
what we have uh, uh, issued uh, about a month ago, say, okay, it's good to have words, but at the end, it's good to have ambitions and to measure what you want to, uh, to achieve. And so we have as an ambition, for instance, to decrease the carbon intensity of the energy products we sell to our clients by about 15%. You see here, it's uh, between NPS, uh, SDS scenario, but quite in line actually with the efforts that have to be done in order to contribute to uh, climate change uh, uh, challenge. And that's the way we, uh, we intend uh, to, uh, to do it. So this presentation is to provide a practical example of what a company, an oil and gas company major, can, can uh, uh, have as an ambition in order to take into account to integrate climate change into a strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Ladislas. Could I ask one question? I mean, I think Total should have um, internal carbon pricing for the future investment decision. What is the price level now? It's about $40 per ton. Ah. So it's increasing. I mean, I, I talked with Patrick, it, he said 30. So it, does it reflecting the current uh, IPCC I'm report? I'm going cetera? to be very precise. Actually, uh, we have different oil price ah, scenarios. Ah, okay. And so uh, depending on the oil price scenario, it's, it, it, it goes from $30 per ton okay. to $40 per ton. I see. Thank you very much. One more question, if I can, about Iran. Total announced withdraw the big money investment from Iran because of the possible sanction, secondary sanction of the United States. The European Union prepared this special clearing house mechanism for the investment to Iran. With, even with this program, Total continued, I mean, has determined to withdraw and not using this mechanism. No, but I, I think it was, maybe my colleague Bertrand is, is, is knows the, that better than I do, but I have the microphone, so I, I, I take advantage of it. But yes, if he wants. But what, what, what I can say, it's very clearly, uh, and it was mentioned by uh, Mr. Trichet uh, today. I mean, th there is absolutely no question, given the retaliation from the U.S. We are listed company in the U.S., and we have more than uh, one third of our shareholders which are American uh, investment firms or pension funds. Uh, there is no way that uh, we are just going to ignore that part. Uh, one, uh, uh, that, that's too important for us. And on top of that, I should mention, uh, we had this um, project in Iran, as you rightly mentioned, but did not commit that much money, actually. That was money to be, to be spent in case we would have had the, the clearance, and we didn't have it. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, before uh, opening the f uh, question to the floor, let me ask one question to all, uh, let's say, uh, panelists. The question is that if renewable energy becomes the mainstream and uh, certainly the demand for fuel moves away from fossil fuel, regardless of what Mr. Trump is uh, pushing, uh, and demand for oil, demand for gas declines, and the oil price getting from $80 per barrel to $8, for example. Just for the sake of our uh, brainstorming or scenario analysis as such, does this low price of oil certainly impact Saudi Arabia, Iran, or Middle East, or Russia, and also United States with the shale production? Does this kind of new world with renewable energy means more peace in the Middle East, or the other way around, more war or battle because of uh, the, let's say, battle for the uh, diminishing uh, returns or profit? What do you think, Olivier? Uh, first, uh, it's clear that uh, the oil consumption will continue to increase. And, uh, 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 yeah, but it will happen in uh, 40 or 50 years from now. So I'm afraid that in between there will be many, many revolutions in the Middle East.
Oh, God. Um, well, uh, for renewable energy to become mainstream, I mean, here again, you will need, uh, these are intermittent technologies, so you will need a lot of gas, a lot of storage, etc., cetera, et cetera, right, as, right. as we mentioned, right? right. So, but I, I'm, I'm willing to play the game. Uh, it, it really depends on when that will happen. So if you assume in, 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 in 40, 50 years' time, I mean, uh, a lot of these countries, I'm hoping, will have time to implement some of the reforms that they have engaged. Um, but here again, I mean, it's very difficult to put all the countries in the same basket because I, I think your second graphic, uh, uh, Tanaka-san, showed how the, 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 the regions are evolving. The countries are becoming importers, exporters at the same time, and being exposed to oil and gas prices totally differently. So I, I, would, not, I would not like to simplify it by putting just one, uh, giving one, just one statement, but I think for some countries, there will be uh, an imperative to push to uh, some reforms uh, more extensively than others. Do, do you think Saudi Arabia... I thought I was not talking in the... <laughs> 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 I said it like three times. I, I am not... <laughs> I, am, I am very stubborn and sticky to ask so, so, question. So what, what was the question? Uh, will Saudi Arabia survive with eight dollars of oil? In when? Uh, when? 2030. Yes. Okay, good. How about you, Dr. Cooper? I'm with Olivier. I don't want to play the game. Uh, if we can play that game, we can imagine we have a magic wand uh -huh. and just typically what we want. That's science fiction. Yes. So, so I'm not willing to play your game. Okay, I, or if you want to play that game, I'm allowed to put in some other things as well. Uh, like, what, like what? A magic wand. A magic which, wand? Which you, no. Is well, Mr. Cooper. Quite at the relevant countries okay. and uh, say, keep peaceful. Ah, for the uh, magic wand for the peace. I just because, you know, my exercise of this kind of volatility you know, many companies are making the scenarios for, pre for preparing for the unprepared situation, I mean, or uh, very much volatile situation. So, so, yes, science fiction is true, but without thinking uh, this kind of very unpredictable situation, well, think, we are, we are in trouble. Well, think 35 decibels a barrel rather than $8 a barrel. 30, okay, <laughs> so what do you think about the 30 dollars a barrel then? I think Dr. Saudi Kupa? Arabia will survive 35 uh -huh. dollars uh -huh. with hey. difficulty, but it will survive. 35 is very easy for Saudi Arabia. I think production yeah. cost is much cheaper. And 8 so. is impossible to yeah. imagine yeah. without a magic wand to go along with it. Well, let's see in 2030 what the oil price would be. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, who knows? And uh, this is a difficult thing, but, uh, uh, you know, without thinking about unprepared situation, Japan faced such a big mess after the uh, crisis in, uh, in, in earthquake and nuclear. So prepare for the unpreparedness is, unprepared situation is, is very, very important. Do you want to play the game, Masuda-san? Yeah. I think there is one, one condition, if I may go along with this, what you said. When as the director of the IEA in charge of oil market, oil prices were uh, single digit. I got a call from Riyadh from my friends and they explained how difficult it is to survive, but said we will be able to survive for a while. Anyway, if oil prices should go to $8 per barrel or 10 the renewable energy need another revolution. Photovoltaic is old, old technology. It's already 150 years old, already technology. We need revolution, revolution, one or two, then make renewable more sustainable and easy to provide. And probably there will be peace in the world because this integrated supply system, consumption system, is more peaceful than integrated one. So I go along with what Tanakhsan said. That's what happened. Thank you. Laila has some additional comments. Yes, I mean, before getting to, uh, to uh, your $8 figure that I think uh, 
a lot of, a lot of us disagree with. Uh, in my second slide, I think I showed all the different levels of, of, of costs breakdown for different countries. So, uh, I mean, before it reaches the low-cost producers, uh, I mean, the Russians and Saudi Arabia and, and others, I mean, you'll have other countries which will be in deep trouble before that. Right. So I don't think the industry will stay uh, not doing anything before that happens. How about you, Radislav? Well, uh, I, I play the game because, uh, and, and by the way, let's remember that at the end of the 90s, the oil price was one digit figure. Yeah. So what uh, seems to me as, as a company important is to take into account not the fact that it will be forever, but that there is cyclicality. And cyclicality is something you can play with by being counter-cyclical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the, of, the, of the answer to the question saying, first, by the way, we, we realize that even in the two-degree scenario of IEA, I mentioned 22% for oil, but it's about 50% for oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And we should not forget that in, in your question at the end, it's for oil and gas because uh, these countries produce both. So, and 50% of the mix under the two degree scenario, it's quite challenging to imagine that you'll get to, uh, uh, to reduce that very significantly. But even if that was the case, and that happened in the past, I think that investing counter cyclicality is, is, is definitely one of the, uh, of the answers to the question. So, so, so you mean, you mean the total will survive? Of course. <laughs> okay, Mr. Cooper, Dr. Cooper, yeah. A question of uh, Ladislas. Uh, one of his four points or five was renewable bio biofuels. What do you have in mind exactly? Because uh, the biofuels I know about, which are eth corn based ethanol and palm oil based fuels, are terrible from a climate change point of view. So what biofuels do you have in mind no. as a part of a solution? The, the, the one that actually we're talking uh, about is really the current biofuels that are being produced because uh, that's right, that second generation, third generation biofuels remains extremely challenging from the technolog technological point of view. But I made that point because I think that's one of the areas where public policy today is helping the case, at least in terms of uh, emissions, because, and, and we don't see that that often on other aspects. There is some in energy efficiency where there are some mandatory objectives that are imposed by public policy, but for instance, we don't really see it on carbon pricing. So I took the example of biofuel saying, ah, at least here, there is a level of incorporation which is made uh, mandatory and at the end which uh, helps the case even though I agree that the impact in the future of additional uh, um, um, biofuels may remain quite uh, limited at the scale of the challenge that we face. Thank you very much. I will open the floor to the questions first. Uh, Don Johnston, my former boss. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, <clears throat> my name is John Johnston, and I was the Secretary General of the OECD <coughs> from uh, 1996 to 2006. So I had the pleasure of actually having uh, Nabil Tanaka, our, our chairman, as uh, one of our first class directors in the organization. Speak up or closer to the mic. Well, I'm not close enough to the mic, but I just wanted to make a few observations. So I've been following this dossier for a long time. In fact, I chaired this, I think it was in Doha, where you, you were then with Total, were you not? And Total, you made a very impressive presentation, as you have. I think Total is actually probably quite exceptional in many respects. But you know, we're really talking here, I, I don't want to sound cynical, but I've heard the story so often, so long, going right back to uh, 1992, there's Rio, and then I came to the OECD, and 97 was the big year, that was the year of UNGAS, you know, the United Nations in general session in, in New York, which, which I addressed. We heard all the terrible things that we were going to cure in the next few years. We had Kyoto, uh, where other countries undertook, you know, and we had annex and non-annex. And Canada, for example, undertook to reduce its, its, um, its emissions to uh, 1990 levels. You know, it was something like 
uh, arcs per cent. In 2010, it abandoned Kyoto because it increased by 25 percent. And we've seen this right across the board. So, you know, really, what I'd just like to say is when you get out of the discussion here, you are talking, you're talking mitigation. That means we're trying to reduce the G greenhouse gas emissions, which we've been uniquely unsuccessful in doing, or adaptation. I don't hear enough about adaptation. I mean, the fact of the matter is, look at the world today. Look around what's happening. Uh, the forest fires in the western United States, in Canada, in northern Sweden, above the Arctic Circle, the temperatures and so on. So I think you have to think in those terms. I'd like to see you talk more about adaptation, uh, less about trying to meet these targets. Uh, finally, it's that, uh, that the people start discussing about adaptation, just mm -hmm. as you said. Yes, that's true. Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ah, wait, wait, wait a minute, push, push now. Okay, go ahead. Yes, we spoke quite a lot about long term. Uh, being on the market, I'm more uh, short term minded. And being short term minded, I would like to have your views about uh, uh, the future of uh, our different commodity prices. Uh, of course, I understand uh, Mrs. Ben Ali doesn't represent Aramco, but uh, I would like to know uh, how much oil. So, uh, Saudi Aramco and Saudi Arabia can pump more in the short term. Can we, can, can we reach $100 uh, dollars per barrel or perhaps more? Uh, you spoke, uh, we spoke much, of, uh, of course, about the price of oil, but I'm also struck by the price of natural gas. Natural gas prices have been uh, uh, has never been so high since the Fukushima crisis. And uh, they, it's really a long-term trend. Uh, with Ladislas, we spoke about the commoditization of the uh, uh, LNG market. Uh, what's your view on the future? And by the way, it was said by uh, Mrs. Ben Ali, uh, the price of coal is pretty high. And the demand for coal, be it uh, uh, steam coal or cooking coal, is uh, uh, pretty high. So we are dreaming about uh, uh, renewables, but on a short-term basis, we are uh, really uh, with almost an energy crisis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, for the question, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, as we are in Morocco, I would like to say that what was mentioned during the debate, that uh, here we can confirm what we lived in this country, especially with renewables. You heard Mr. Bakuri during the lunch, but the price that we reach on the project on wind is three cents per kilowatt hour, four cents for PV. It's big power plants produced by private companies and selling to this price uh, to, the, to the utility. So it's true. We are working to have 52% of our electricity capacity in 2030 from renewables. It's possible because we have interconnections with Spain, with Algeria, soon with Portugal and Mauritania. It's also possible because we have water pumping for storage. We have also melting salt for storage in Warzazat, and also batteries. We're talking about big projects, but don't forget, especially for Africa, how small projects PV roofs, PV pumping can be used in the whole continent. And it's something that is as important as big power plants. But there's also these solutions that can be also something important. Last point, I'm heading the Moroccan Agency for Energy Efficiency. And I think the cheapest way, the fastest way of reaching this climate indices is through energy efficiency. We should work on energy efficiency in industry, transport, housing, public lighting, agriculture. In all those sectors, we have a program for that. So that's also as important as the big power plants. That's as my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Are you from Massa? No, Ami is the other agency in oh. charge of energy efficiency. Ah, okay. We have two agencies in our energy transition policies, Mazen for the big power plants uh -huh. with renewables, uh -huh. and uh, Ame is the Moroccan agency for energy efficiency. I think I see. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, Mr. Makuri mentioned about Makuri mentioned about this uh, sustainable uh, energy uh, transmission project with the European uh, Union, Germany, or France, or Portugal. That is very interesting initiative of uh, Morocco. So.
Please go ahead. I'm Jean-Louis Toubul, former president of Shenia Marketing. So I will advocate a little bit for gas. On the short term, uh, I, I don't fully agree which, with what has been said just now. Uh, the price of gas in the United States is $3 per million BTU. Yeah. So it's very cheap. And with the startup of the LNG export out of the US and with the commoditization of LNG, I don't believe that the price of gas will go up. It's true that in Asia and in Europe, with the price of gas index on oil, there could be some time where the, these prices will remain high, but in my mind, it's very temporarily, in my mind. So, and, and within the next two or three years, there will be plenty of new uh, liquefaction projects in the US, which will help the gas prices to become more and more uh, a commodity price with a world price, more, more and more. On the longer term, uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure to fully understand uh, your, uh, Mr. Tanaka, your, your guess, your curve on the cost of wind. In my mind, I'm not sure that this cost will go down so, so fast. And as a, as a matter of fact, today, uh, all the renewable prices are still highly subsidized, especially in Europe. Uh, on, on, always on the long term, if you don't build additional nuke power plants in the world, the numbers do not square without high development of natural gas. They just do not fly. So I'm not sure to understand your curve where there is a peak gas in 2030-35. And I'm, I'm not sure uh, to understand that. Uh, on the storage of electricity, and this has been stressed uh, by Mr. Cooper, uh, battery, everybody insists about battery. I, I highly believe in the future of hydrogen. And you can produce hydrogen with electricity uh, outside the peak hours. So practically, the cost of producing hydrogen can be negative or almost zero. You can use hydrogen in the fuel cell, even in the cars. Somebody has said that in the car for the mobility, you will still need battery. It's not obvious in my mind. You have a lot of technology of power to gas, to use electricity to produce hydrogen, and, this in, and then inject hydrogen into the network of natural gas. So you have still plenty of technology which are under development and which allow natural gas to increase its market share, even if uh, the renewables are seen as a solution for everything. Thank you. For your uh, question to my I mean, uh, chart, yes, uh, the 2030 peak of uh, gas is uh, still that chart, the gas is increasing, even with the sustainable development scenario, 450 scenario. Oil peak out very quickly around 2020, coal much earlier, but gas will continue to grow until 2030 or 2040. Yeah, so, but, but, but slowing down, if sustainable scenario or two degrees Celsius or 1.5 happens, because it's still carbon uh, emission happens. By the way, uh, uh, it's, uh, we have 10 minutes more, so let's, uh, I'll give the floor to the panelists to answer some of the questions about price or some of the questions about uh, uh, gas uh, role. Uh, Olivier, let's start with uh, Olivier. <coughs> uh, a few comments, and uh, I would like to develop a little bit uh, the issue of the uh, oil embargo uh, to Iran, which is a short-term issue. Um, first, clearly, uh, adaptation was part of the Kyoto Protocol, and in the following COPs, it almost disappeared, and now, as, uh, as you said, it appears quite difficult to cope with uh, 2 degrees or 1.5, and then it's very important to consider, to, to consider adaptation. And I, just, I understand that it will be one important part of the next COP in Poland, 
it's clear that they will not discuss a lot of, uh, they will not push the, uh, the, the theme of mitigation, but I think it will, it's a good news. Second part, what struck me when we discuss about energy is that uh, I remind that electricity re represents 20% of the problem, but 95% of the comments. And when we discuss about uh, renewable energy, we discuss about solar and wind, but in fact, don't forget that 80% of the uh, final uh, energy consumption is non-electricity. Uh, Show a few words on uh, the uh, embargo. The uh, oil embargo on Iran is one of the one important explanation of the oil uh, price now, because the thanks to the decision taken by OPEC Plus uh, two years ago, the market is now almost uh, stable, uh, in uh, good balance. Uh, but on the top of that, there is this decision of Trump to uh, set up an embargo against, uh, against uh, Iran. In fact, the spare capacity, uh, the, the stocks are at a uh, low level worldwide. The spare capacity is not so high. Uh, the official figures is 2.7 million barrels per day or 2.5 and w uh, around 1.8 in Saudi Arabia. And uh, my experience uh, at the IEA is that uh, spare capacity, well, you don't know exactly when will you get, when it, be, it will be possible to get this uh, production. It uh, may take uh, three months, uh, six months, or one year, because uh, it needs, it's necessary to, need, it needs uh, some investment. So, uh, the, uh, what uh, is for me the most challenging is the reaction of Iran uh, or, uh, uh, to this uh, position of, uh, the, uh, of Trump, and this may create a mess in the uh, uh, Gulf, uh, in the Persian Gulf, uh, just I remember that uh, the missiles uh, of uh, uh, Iran have been tested on the Strait of Hormuz. And uh, if there is anything which happened, uh, 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 it will be totally impossible to uh, load oil uh, in the Gulf of, uh, in the Persian Gulf. I remind that uh, Persia, the threat of almost the Persian Gulf represent 20% uh, of the uh, world oil consumption and 25% of the LNG. Uh, so uh, this may, uh, it's not uh, a, a new, uh, uh, an increase of the prices. I would say nobody knows at what level it may come. We may come to $200 per barrel because there is no elasticity on the market. And uh, also this uh, situation of, uh, uh, yeah, that's um, the comments I wanted to, to make. And I have very specific views on uh, hydrogen. I'm not a believer. I think hydrogen is the question of religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are, yeah, Japanese are very religious about hydrogen, yes. Laila, do you have comments on the stock, I mean, uh, <laughs> spare capacity? Well, I mean, uh, here again, first point, I'm not mandated to talk about short-term markets and Saudi Arabia's <laughs> production policy, again. Second point, Olivier Appert has already made all the comments that need to be made about the spare capacity, so thank you very much, Olivier, yeah, yeah, for fine. the, <laughs> well, thank you so much. I mean, he always saves me in, uh, in those meetings. Um, no, but I, I mean, on gas, I, I really want to, uh, because yes, we can be concerned about what is happening in the oil markets, and I think there was a lot of dr work being done for to, have, to bring those 25 countries together in OPEC plus alliance. But there are also some concerns on the gas side, because today in Europe, I mean, I, I agree with the points that was made on the US, but today in Europe, gas prices are $3.5 million uh, dollars per million BTU higher than the same time last year. We don't know what will happen this winter. We don't know if we're going to have uh, a, co a very a colder winter than average or, or not. So 
uh, these are also, and, and, and in many of these countries, I mean, uh, gas prices are being now reformed and uh, linked to uh, international gas prices as well. So that's, that's also an aspect that I just wanted to highlight as well in the meantime. Thank you, Ray. Dr. Cooper. Um, well, I address mainly long-term issues, but since uh, Iran has been raised, don't you think that uh, the Iranian problem, in quotes, will be solved by China? Uh, China uh, could take Iranian oil, uh, it's substitutable for other kinds of oil, and uh, China could well set up a clearing arrangement, which did not use SWIFT or the dollars, uh, U.S. dollars at all, and Chinese firms operating in the U.S. would have a problem like Total would, but there are Chinese firms that don't operate in the U.S. at all. So is, uh, do you uh, seriously think that Iran will not be able to export its two million barrels a day, say? What I, can, what I heard on the market recently is that uh, uh, the Bank of Kundrun, Kundrun Bank, which is more or less the only bank which has a kind of monopoly of relationships between China and uh, Iran, which is owned by CNPC, has just uh, finished uh, accepting uh, bills uh, by Iran paid either in euro or in yuans. Mm -hmm. And it is said on the market that for November there is no Iranian oil which has been bought either by CNPC or Sinopec. That's, uh, that's it, you know. Uh, even, uh, even the Chinese have problem with uh, that uh, rights that you, ha you Americans have with the dollar. Uh, uh, may I rem remind you that it did cost $10 billion to BNP Paribas. Talking about November, that's just a week away. Yeah. I'm not talking about November, I'm talking about the next few years. And uh, whatever happens in November uh, has almost already happened. But if I were advising the Chinese government, I could construct a scheme that did not use the U.S. dollar, nor would it involve Sinopec or uh, 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 yeah. uh, CNP. See, because they both have business in North America, at least in Canada. Um, but um, there's a way to do it, and the question is how imaginative they and the Iranians together uh, will be about bringing it about. And there are lots of two-way trade. It's not just oil from Iran to China, but it's Chinese goods going to Iran. And so you, it, it's uh, basically barter with a little uh, fluid to grease it, basically. Thank you. I think the European Union invited China to join that clearing house. Is that right? I have heard that, but I don't know. OK, let's move to uh, Masuda-san. Masuda. OK, just to make one, one comment on uh, renewable energy. I think we talked a lot about the renewable energy and storage, but uh, Obviously, we need second and third revolution in technology. And what we face about technological evolution is there is two types of death of valley, death valley, valley of death. One is uh, technical valley of death to make you know, new, new technology to be able to be developed fully. That's one. And there's a lot of shortage of supply of financing, one. And second is financial death of valley. If though there is a demonstration plant ready to go, there's no one to invest and there's no way to commercialize. So unless we are able to overcome all these valley of death in technological development deployment, uh, we won't be able to have revolution. But otherwise, we can have technological revolution which again completely rewrite the energy scene. And IEA World Energy Outlook could be very obsolete in a few years unless they are able to do it. And we have to do that. That's my ending remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ladislav. Maybe quick comments on the, 
on the on the price uh, i think short term there are definitely some supportive fundamentals for the oil price because uh, demand is still uh, significant opec and russia are uh, well lined then one very specific element with regard to the us where there are some bottlenecks of exporting uh, shale oil uh, by pipe so uh, probably until the uh, mid next year uh, there will be some constraints on the uh, on the U.S. market, the, the exports uh, reduced from Iran, of course, and uh, don't forget uh, Venezuela, Libya. There are some countries uh, which still uh, face quite some difficulties. Not taking into account the fact that we have to keep in mind that the level of investments that have been made in the oil and gas industry has decreased very significantly after, by 2014-15 uh, when the oil price collapsed. And there are some uh, impacts that are going to be associated with that. So I think it's quite supportive on the, on the, on the short run, even though uh, for me on the mid-run or long term, the key word remains volatility. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, I really appreciate very, uh, your participation to the interesting game I raised, and uh, I, I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion here.